I was in Halifax on vacation. That's where I met him. I was told he was the nicest guy in the world, but I didn't like him. He was a plastic surgeon, and I thought plastic surgery made people feel flawed. Most of his practice was reconstructive, even life-saving surgery. Still, somehow I managed to focus on the little bit that was cosmetic, and I wrote him off. But then we started to get to know each other, and I discovered it was true. He really was the nicest guy in the world. After a brief summer romance, I went back to Toronto and tried to convince myself it wasn't going to work out. For one thing, there was the distance between us. Secondly, he had a dog and I'd have a cat if I had a pet, which I didn't. But above all, I was an artist and he was a scientist. Wasn't that like oil and water? Still, I just couldn't get him out of my mind. So I came up with an idea that might help keep us going across the long distance. I asked him if he wanted to send handmade postcards back and forth. He said he'd love to. The first postcard I sent was about what I did that day. A few days later, I got his postcard in the mail. It showed where he removed skin cancer off different parts of patients' bodies and then grafted and patched and sewed the skin up again. Our days were pretty different. Once when I was visiting Halifax, he was called back to the hospital to fix the hand of a poor guy who had accidentally nailed his fingers together with a nail gun. He asked if I wanted to come watch him work. I said I'd love to. I looked on awestruck as he carefully removed the nail and fixed up each of the fingers as good as new. He was an artist. One evening, when we were describing how our days went, he told me that the mother of a young child felt her son's ears stuck out too far and was worried he would be made fun of when he was older. So she came in to have them surgically pinned back. I asked if he was going to do the operation. He said he already did. My stomach flipped. I couldn't believe he did an operation on someone, a child who was perfectly healthy. I went back to Toronto and couldn't stop thinking about the little boy with the big ears. It made me wonder if plastic surgeons who do cosmetic surgery look at people differently. Do they see people as broken and flawed and through cosmetic surgery they'll be fixed? As I thought about this, I was staring at my bulletin board and my eye caught a class photo of myself as a child and it hit me. It wasn't about him seeing me as flawed. It was me. When I was a little kid, I wasn't a pretty girl, but I was pretty cute. My hair was really fine and always tangled in a big puff ball behind my head. I had buck teeth and a scar between my nose and my lip from a bad tobogganing accident. But when you're a kid, anything can happen. One day, you might blossom from the ugly duckling into a beautiful swan. I was standing in front of the mirror with Sherry. We were eight years old and topless. Sherry had permanently tanned, caramel-colored skin, and mine looked translucent next to hers, with a map of blue veins shooting from my nipples. It was the first time I remember comparing myself to someone else and envying what they had, and I didn't. In grade seven, Sherry started doing aerobics, to lose fat on her thighs. I'd never considered my thighs before. I looked down. I was wearing a pair of hot pink corduroys and I was suddenly aware of my thighs and how they looked. Not slim and straight like they'd once been. Maybe they did seem fat and it pretty much went downhill from there.
My body started to feel warped and off kilter. I got braces and pimples. My fine hair became dark and oily. And then there was my nose. It just seemed to get bigger and bigger. My only comfort was that others seemed to be going through their own version of the same thing. So there was a silent camaraderie between us all. It was a hellish time for everyone. Well, almost everyone. Gracie Sullivan somehow bypassed puberty hell. Occasionally, a mean kid would make fun of my nose, and I'd try to just blow them off. Still, it definitely hurt. But then there was one girl in my class with whom I felt a particular unspoken bond, Belinda. We were born a day apart. She also had a big nose, and we were friends. Maybe it was good to be different. Maybe our noses gave us character. On the first day of grade eight, I looked over at Belinda and I was shocked. She said hi, but it was as though her voice had taken up residence in someone else's body. She looked as though she was wearing a disguise. Over the summer, Belinda had gotten a nose job. I went home and told my mother about Belinda's nose job. Every parent wants their child to be happy, and I could tell that my mother felt terrible for me. She asked me if I wanted to get a nose job too. And I wondered, is this how I could transform into the beautiful swan? I left the kitchen, went to the bathroom and locked the door. I looked in the mirror, studying my profile. I got out a marker and drew a dotted line, showing what it would look like if I changed the shape of my nose. I looked at that part of me, the part that could be changed for a long time, and it scared me. I decided that no matter how big my nose got, I couldn't change it. It was part of me. But I also decided something else. I was flawed. I'd pretend it didn't bother me, but it did. I started to hate my nose, and I blamed it on cosmetic surgery, resenting it for making me feel like there was a right kind of nose, and for putting me in a position to choose whether or not to get mine fixed. My nose became a topic I couldn't talk about, a part of me that although prominently located in the center of my face, I tried to ignore until I fell in love with a plastic surgeon and I couldn't ignore it anymore. Back in Toronto, I was confused. I felt farther away from him than I ever had. I wanted things to be how they once were, but I didn't know how they could be. I stared at the beautiful handmade postcards that were pinned to my bulletin board. The postcards that seemed symbolic of his openness, of his willingness. I couldn't let this go. So I suggested we send each other a postcard that had a secret on it. Something that we'd never told each other about ourselves. It was the one postcard that could be sent in an envelope. Once I told him my secret, my flaw immediately stopped being a flaw. It just became my nose again. Something else happened. It's when we really started to get to know each other. It was the beginning. Now I'm in Halifax, and we live together. The other night over dinner, when we were telling each other about our days, he told me that a mother came into his office with her young son, wanting to have his ears pinned back. 
He told me that he asked the little boy what he thought of his ears. The little boy shrugged and said he liked them. He told the boy that he liked them too, and he sent them away. Maybe the point is to not fit in. Why would you want to see yourself as ordinary when you can be extraordinary? Besides, it's what makes life interesting. <laughs>